everyone and welcome back to Queenie of London. Thank you for joining me for another lovely walk in the London sunshine. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, for those of you that are new here, hi, I'm Queenie and as well as showing you the sights, I like to offer up a little knowledge of my wonders around London town. I've got a bit of a bumper edition for you today which is going to be split into two parts two feature length episodes if you will <laughs> so make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss the second part I'm going to be traveling along an area known as Millbank all the way to the palaces of Westminster down the river down there uh, there's loads to show you along the way and a lot lot to learn <laughs> uh, so keep watching to walk London with a Londoner so today I begin my walk on Vauxhall Bridge with Vauxhall to the south and Plimlico to the north of the river now I'm only just going to show you this here this postmodern rather complicated construction was designed by architect Terry Farrell and you probably all know this is the headquarters of the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, the United Kingdom's Foreign Intelligence Agency. Uh, it's also known as Legoland or Babylon on Thames <laughs> uh, because of the dual design influences of the Industrial Revolution and Aztec and Mayan temples. Now, unfortunately, I left my entry pass on the number 11 bus so I'm not able to take you inside today, but I can tell you that the building was opened by the big boss, Queen Elizabeth II, in July 1994, after Margaret Thatcher gave the nod to approve the purchase of the building for SIS use in 1988. Large parts of the working building are below ground level, and there is a warren of underground tunnels within. It is rumored that there is a further tunnel which goes under the Thames which links the building to the corridor of power all the way down there, Whitehall. Uh, there are two moats which you can actually hear if you go close enough uh, for protection and the windows are triple glazed. Of course we all know it rather well indeed from multiple Bond appearances, the Bond films, where it is the base of the double O and Q branches. Uh, for now, we'll move away from international espionage, but there will be another similar headquarters coming up a little later in the walk. So when we come to the end of Vauxhall Bridge here, we'll find ourselves on Millbank. Uh, this is the road which leads straight to the Palace of Westminster. And I've got some blimmin' brilliant views to show you along the way. I've also got a lot of info about the many noteworthy buildings in this area. One of them, that really, really tall tower over there. I'll talk about that. So grab yourself a nice glass of something, put your feet up, and enjoy.
So it's actually in 1546 when the name Millbank is first recorded anywhere and at that time it belonged to Westminster Abbey. Uh, the name derives from the presence of water mills all along this stretch of the banks of the Thames. In that direction, where all the trees are over there that you can see, we have Grosvenor Road. Now, the name Grosvenor is central to Westminster in much the same way that the names Sloan and Cadogan are central to the history of Chelsea. Uh, before 1677, the Grosvenors had really only amassed lands in Cheshire. So what happened in 1677 to change their fortune was that a 21-year-old Sir Thomas Grosvenor, who had inherited a baronetcy from his grandfather at just eight years old, married a 12-year-old young lady called Mary Davis. Mary Davis had a pretty hefty dowry. She was an heiress to the manor of Ebury, which was at that time little but a land of marsh, meadow and pasture. This land, however, is what we know now to be Pimlico, Belgravia, Mayfair and Knightsbridge. So she was quite a catch. Now, the last of the water mills of Millbank was demolished early in the 18th century and from what I can gather through a little bit of research I did for this video, this demolition occurred because Grosvenor House, the London seat of the Grosvenor family, um, was in 1730 being sort of extended and modernised. This house remained until 1809 when land was then demanded to build something very, very large and very, very sombre. And we'll pick up that point when I get to something quite of note to show you. And I'm going to have to go down these stairs and we all know that I don't like stairs, so I'll see you at the bottom. See, they were steep, right? <laughs> Now this construction, which demanded the land of the Grosvenor 
house, there's very, very few signs that remain of this construction. And this pretty unnoteworthy, blink and you'll miss it, circular bollard is one of those only remnants that remain. Now this part of Millbank's past is very bleak and as I said very sombre and this something is Millbank Prison or Millbank Penitentiary. This opened in 1816 and this old buttress would have been used to tie the ships uh, that were being docked on the river here to take the prisoners of Millbank Prison downstream to the larger prison vessels that were moored in Woolwich Arsenal and were used to make the incredibly long voyage to Australia. Good. Now, the prison of Millbank is particularly interesting because of its design. When I was an undergraduate at a university, we were set to pee, read a piece of a, a critical theory which focused on the ideas of a chap called Jeremy Bentham. Bentham was a social reformer who he's actually worth reading about, and if you really fancy, one second. If you really fancy, you can actually go and see his mummified remains in the atrium of UCL's student centre. Uh, he's put there because he helped to found UCL. So he proposed a new pioneering shape for prisons which incorporated a central tall tower known as the panopticon. The word panopticon uh, comes from the Greek for all seeing. This central watchtower enabled a guard to observe over every area of the prison at once. And it was thought that constant surveillance would condition inmates to behave and to increase their likelihood of reform once released. Hi. So, in 1799, Bentham purchased all this area of land around Millbank to make an actual version of his theoretical idea. Uh, there are a lot of obstacles when the plan actually came into action so the original scheme was abandoned but the architect that eventually got on board with the uh, idea for a prison he was named sir robert smirk he also went on to design the british museum i think uh, he incorporated the principles of bentham's theory of the panopticon so the prison that actually was built on this site was hexagonal in shape there were six three-story pentagonal blocks that each had five courtyards and they all came off bentham's central watchtower around the outer walls of the prison there was a stagnant moat which obviously provided the perfect conditions for the spread of cholera amongst inmates with very little immunity uh, to disease so epidemics of dysentery and scurvy were also rife. Now the first prisoners uh, to arrive were all women and they admitted whilst the building was still being constructed in 1816 and the first group of male prisoners arrived seven months later. These initial prisoners were thought to be capable of redemption, so their exile to Botany Bay was replaced by a sentence of 10 years incarceration. Now, as I've already sort of alluded to, the building was plagued from the offset 
by the marshy terrain of this area being so near to the banks of the Thames. And because of all the problems, by 1843, Millbank Prison became little more than a holding place to keep convicts before they were exiled to Australia. It is thought that up to 4,000 prisoners a year were transported. Now we're not sure about the validity of this little fact, but it's thought that the Aussie slang term POM is an abbreviation for Prisoner of Billbank. Now, even amongst its contemporaries, Millbank Prison was known to be a very grisly place. <laughs> and it didn't really owe much to the forward thinking of Jeremy Bentham, who ultimately wanted reformed prisons and Charles Dickens gives an apt description of the area and the prison in David Copperfield as a melancholy waste. Prisoners had very little exercise, very little food and poor health care. Uh, they were also subject to beatings, solitary confinement and prolonged periods of coerced silence. It remained as a prison after exiles to Australia ceased in 1867 and finally closed its doors in 1890, its sheer scale meant that it took a great deal of time to demolish completely, uh, which leads me <laughs> rather neatly to the story of this over here, which is, of course, the Tate Britain. So I'm going to attempt, I might have to go down there, double back, so I can get us closer and have a little look. So I'll see you on the other side. So, whilst uh, the dreadful Millbank prison was still being demolished, um, they used a lot of the bricks, by the way, in the construction of the new Millbank estate, which is round the back. A gentleman named Sir Henry Tate, of Tate and Lyle sugar fame, he wrote to the National Gallery uh, to bequeath his collection of modern British art worth in today's money about £6 million. He wanted to give it to the nation. When the site of the old prison had been cleared, it was decided that the space should be given over to a new gallery for British art and Tate donated a further vast sum towards the building costs. The architect of this rather splendid building was one Sidney Smith, who had worked on several of the libraries that Tate had founded in London, including one in Brixton, South Lambeth and Ballam. And the new National Gallery of British Art, as it was originally called, was opened on the 21st of July, 1897 by the Prince of Wales. Uh, the gallery was extended to house the extensive collection of works left to the nation by JMW Turner on his death. Uh, they had been previously jointly housed by the National Gallery and the British Museum because his collection was so big. I'm just going to get a little snap because I like that angle. Now, during the First World War, a lot of the paintings inside this wonderful gallery uh, were taken to Aldwych Tube Station for safekeeping underground. At this time, the Queen Alexandra Military Hospital was located uh, directly behind the building, uh, I believe. Uh, the Tate also took this over in the 1970s and the gallery was used as a shelter for patients of the hospital 
during air raids. Paintings during the war were also taken to the post office vaults to make space for the Ministry of Pensions, which also needed extra storage. Um, although it had really always been known and referred to as the Tate Gallery, it was only in 1932 that the gallery's trustees officially identified it as such. Now, I think, I did this a long time ago myself, I think you can still get a boat from over on Millbank Pier called the Tate Tate, which takes you to the Tate Modern on South Bank used to be free but don't quote me on it now but I will leave a link below so that you can have a little look if you're interested I think they're also run by the uber clippers now um, talking about war at the outbreak of the second world war plans had been made to evacuate the collections to underground stations again because it was quite effective in the first world war and five railway containers worth of art was dispersed among three private country houses and I think from what I've read, a lot of them wanted to store them in their country houses for not so selfless means. <laughs> uh, I think they nicked a few, to be honest. Larger sculptural works inside the gallery, because as you can imagine, a gallery like this has some pretty impressive stuff inside. They had brick uh, walls built around them and they remained in the gallery along with some paintings which were accommodated in blast-proof storage uh, in the basement. Green Park Underground Station and from 1941 onwards disused tunnels at Piccadilly were also used for storage for the Tate and for the Museum of London. These are beautiful setting, I've never been around this side. There are four museums encompassed by the Tate name, the Tate Modern, Tate Liverpool and Tate St Ives and this one here and they share the Tate collection of art and the awarding of the annual Turner Prize takes place in this gallery every other year and it remains free to visit. also got a nice cafe in I remember <laughs> one of the best exhibitions I've ever seen in London is uh, one that they had here with the etchings of William Blake incredibly tiny so incredibly intricate and filled with passion and knowledge one of the greatest exhibitions I've ever been to in London and I've been to quite a few so we're just going to double back for a little while and I'm going to take you to something else artistic while we're on topic. So the road that I'm going to come on to now is Attenbury Street <clears throat> and these red brick buildings in front of us uh, were what was previously the Royal Army Medical College. Now during the First World War the college was used to prepare vaccines and I believe the vaccine for typhoid was developed in this very college. The gas mask was also developed here as the college researched into protection against chemical attack and warfare. It was seriously damaged during World War II and the walls of the Tate Gallery, if we have a little look around 
thing on this side still shows signs of bomb damage. And the medical college remained here until 1999. And I'll head around the front in a minute to speak about what it became. So here's the side of the Tate Britain here. And we'll cross over. I believe the main entrance to what I'm going to show you is on John Islip Street. But I like showing this view of it because it's rather palatial, I think. I like this little central courtyard. Now, although it hasn't always been in this building, the Chelsea College of Arts was founded in 1895 and it's a constituent institution of the University of the Arts, London. Me being me, <laughs> I had a little poke about on their website and the college states that their teaching focuses on material based investigation and creative process and they offer courses in fine art design and curating. They have a particular interest, interestingly, on the effects of globalisation. This college has also got some pretty famous names amongst its alumni, including Alexa Chung, the model, Ralph Fiennes, Quentin Blake, the illustrator, David Hockney, Alan Rickman, God bless him, Paul Nash, and Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen of 12 Years a Slave rather than of The Great Escape. So that's the Chelsea College of Art. Although not all of what uh, we see of Millbank today dates from the 1930s, the area had to be extensively rebuilt to pre uh, repair damage caused by the 1928 Thames flood. floods was caused by a period of excessive snowfall and the melting of that snowfall at the Thames source and then it coupled with a period of very heavy rainfall and consequently the Thames recorded its highest ever levels. And as I was walking here, I noticed that the embankment walls here are a heck of a lot higher than they are at other points along the river. This is quite expressive as this area was probably the worst hit and the worst affected by the Thames flood. There was a 25 metre section 
of the embankment which collapsed entirely and I think it was the area exactly opposite the Tate that was most seriously affected. It is thought that water got into the gallery through old prison vaults beneath the ground that had not been adequ adequately filled in. Uh, the water caused damage to the collections on the lower galleries and a total of 226 oil paintings were submerged in Thames water. Tragically, 4,000 Londoners lost their homes as a result of this flood and there were sadly many deaths and injuries. Much of the area around Lambeth Bridge, which we're coming up to shortly, was run down and so a massive regeneration project was stimulated by the flood and it led ultimately, there's a bloody long gap in between though, to the creation of the Thames Barrier which opened in 1984. One last view. There you go, come visit, it's lovely. I'm going to stick on this side because I'm very short and I can barely see over that wall. says there is Millbank Tower. It's constructed in 1963 and up until it was replaced by the BT Tower it was the tallest building in the United Kingdom until 1964. Obviously it's been <laughs> beaten quite a few times since the 60s. It's had some pretty 
high profile occupants, mostly political in nature. The uh, Labour Party ran its general election campaign from here from 1994 to 2002. The United Nations has also had offices here, as have the Office for National St uh, Statistics, easy for me to say, the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman and the Ministry of Justice Record Service have also been found in here. Between 2006 and 2014, the Conservative Party based its campaign headquarters from here as well. Uh, before its collapse, many cheers. This was also the home to the Central People's Vote Office and also to the studios of Russian state-controlled Russia Today TV. Now, the brothers who own this building, the Rubens, in 2016, they applied to redevelop and convert these office spaces into, you guessed it, luxury apartments and another hotel. in there. This building, vast long thing that takes up the whole block here, as its shuttered and blanked out windows may suggest, is the headquarters of the International Security Service MI5. They've been here at Thames House, its official name, since 1994. Since this area was the site of the realisation of Jeremy Bentham's idea of the all-seeing panopticon, the watchtower, I find it quite fitting that within a short distance there are two buildings which house the nation's spires. As I'm walking, clock this central arch and things that you can see, because I'm going to go over the road to talk to you about it. You can't clock it because they're doing some work. They are. Just clock them two there, all right. <laughs> so, 
so either side of that imposing central entry arch there were two figures one was St George on the left and one of Britannia on the right uh, there were also works uh, by Charles Sergeant Jagger who's responsible for a great many war memorials not least the Royal Artillery Memorial I think it's called at High Park uh, but there's several other sculptures built onto the facade which we don't know the um, provenance of there's one of Old Father Thames uh, one of a mermaid and another above the arch at the top was of a male figure who is blindfolded holding the scales of justice one of the weights in the balance has a royal crown and the other has a flat cap for the working man so that's some pretty interesting symbolism there now this building was opened by John Major, the then Prime Minister and it's also, hence my little speedy walk past it, <laughs> as of 2007 it's a criminal offence to trespass into the building or venture too closely. According to an authorised history of MI5, we know what little we do know is that inside there's a very very cool miniature monorail which brings up files from the basement to staff working throughout the whole building and there is old father Tim's over there which is similar but not identical to Thames House is Imperial Chemical House they're both in a neoclassical style which was popular in interwar years and they're both the design of Stepney Boy Sir Frank Baines they're both products of the regeneration of Mill Bank following the flood of 1928 and they were looked after in their design and construction by the government's office of works and intended to tie in with the design of this bridge which is Lambeth Bridge running down the middle here I think I'm going to stay here for this for now <laughs> is this road which is Horse Ferry Road very famous for a lot of buildings down there again mainly governmental parliamentary now as the name suggests in the 16th century there was no bridge here but there was a horse Ferry. It was owned by the Archbishop of Canterbury and it was used to link the Palace of Westminster, which we're quite close to now, to Lambeth Palace, which is his official London residence over on the other side. There's always a toot in my tours. <laughs>
over there. You can see the London Eye on South Bank. You can see St Thomas's Hospital, home of Florence Nightingale's first school of nursing. Let's go up here. And you can see my endpoint and a Westminster Bridge, more on those later. Over there, you might be able to see there's a funny square box. US Embassy and I can completely understand why Mr Trump was a bit disgruntled because that is no Grosvenor Square is it? But you can hope that it will be somewhat safe here. Now I'm going to take you on a little diversion over to the other side of Lambeth Bridge to show you a couple more sites of note which you can probably see peeking through the trees there and obviously there's some amazing views coming up of the Palace of Westminster from the other side so if you're enjoying the walk so far guys, please feel very free to give me a thumbs up as it helps other people discover my tours. So this church that we can see here was St Mary at Lambeth before it was de-consecrated in 1977. There's been a church on this site since incredibly the 12th century and it has huge six, uh, historical value. Uh, the tower there, bar some repair works in the 1800s is what was originally constructed in 1377 so it seems pretty ignorant and disrespectful that it was scheduled for demolition now thankfully the building was saved and became the museum of garden history and there's its sign there which i think is pretty cool don't you um this created london's only dedicated museum to the art, history and designs of gardens. Can I walk in there? But filling 
this museum, with a, uh, this church with a garden museum rather the other way around, wasn't really a random axe. In this churchyard here can be found the resting place of the 17th century royal gardener John Tredescant, uh, the elder and the younger. The elder housed his vast collection of seeds and bulbs in a house here in Lambeth known as the Ark. Around the Ark were great botanical gardens which the Tresescants used to introduce plants from foreign shores into English soil. The Ark became the first museum open to the public in the whole of England, so it's quite appropriate that where they rest is also now a museum. On their death, the collection was handed over to Oxford University and formed the basis of what we now know to be the Ashmolean Museum. Beautiful, very, very quirky place to visit. And right next door to it here, we have the entry to Lambeth Palace. Obviously this church had a strong association with the palace. Now this, unfortunately, is all I'm going to be able to show you today because it's currently closed for visitors, the actual palace. It is the Archbishops of Canterbury's main London residence, so it acts as a family home. So visiting is kind of restricted even when it's open. So I will leave the links below because I believe it's opening again in 2024 for some tours. But you can visit the gardens, um, on specific dates and the library in there which is public. Uh, so what we're looking at here is an early Tudor brick gatehouse built by Cardinal John Morton. It was completed in 1496. And it looks rather like Hampton Court Palace to me. I like the work on those turrets there, the battlements. Very, very castle fortress like, appropriate for its positioning on the banks of the Thames. Uh, as sort of alluded to there, what is really, really special about Lambeth Palace is its library. It's the largest collection of religious texts outside of the Vatican. Um, when the library was founded by Archbishop Richard Bancroft in 1610, he intended it to be for public use, so he was a bit of a good guy. And you can come and visit the library by appointment. In order to use it, you must register as a reader in much the same way as you would do at the British Library if you wanted to go and use that in Euston. Uh, because of the vast size of its collection, it's housed in a very, very functional, not at all historic building from 2021. It has previously, sorry, it has previously existed inside the actual palace but books need protecting nowadays don't they so that's all right with me picture
also from the Books of Lambeth Palace Library to Bridges. Now, Lambeth Bridge over there, you'll notice, although it's looking a bit faded, isn't it? It's red <laughs> to represent the seating in the House of Lords, which is at the southern end of the Palace of Westminster, nearest this bridge. And Westminster Bridge down there is green to represent the colour of the seating in the House of Commons, situated at the northern end of the Houses of Parliament. I'm not sure if you can make out because it's incredibly sunny, but there are awnings over there at the palace. Uh, they are at the outside seating areas for the member bars and restaurants of the Houses of Parliament. And they have a blooming cracking view, don't they? Now, I won't go into too much of the history of the bridges today, but when we get closer, you, well, you may have noticed already actually, because I think I did pan upwards, you will notice that Lambeth Bridge has these four pillars to it either end of the bridge and they are topped rather quirkily with a pineapple. Uh, these pineapples were incorporated into the design, it's thought, might be a bit of an urban legend this one, um, as a sort of tribute to the gentleman previously mentioned, Tradescantz because it's thought that he was the first person to grow pineapples in the UK. As I said at the beginning of this video, I'm going to split this tour in two. So in the next part, I'll be walking down the last part of Millbank through some gorgeous little gardens with some incredible memorials with freedom at the heart of the message, taking you to a rather tiny hidden gem down in College Green and to a beautiful little church with an incredible story to tell. So make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss part two of this tour of Millbank. So I hope you enjoyed this sunny walk guys and until the next time 
always remember to do London with a Londoner. Take care guys, love you.